I think uh, it's it's very it's it's recommended by doctors because it's it's very suitable. It doesn't elevate the, the blood blood sugar level, so it's it's acceptable. But the recommendations are about the same for anybody else. Uh, the um, amounts which are recommended, if you if you can get used to using high amounts of xylitol, you can use it in in cooking. That's no problem. And also, it has a very low GI. So if you are one of these who want to to be on a Montignac diet or, or something corresponding. So xalitol is very suitable for that also. Professor Mackin is aware of this research and there is uh, a little bit about uh, the effects of xylitol in, in this, for instance, this article <laughs> about the uh, anti-glycation effects of, of xylitol, that it helps keep our connective tissue younger and helps helps prevent the uh, 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 forming these complexes between the sugar and the protein that inactivates the structural uh, proteins in our systems. Yeah, that's the so-called protein sparing effect that the Australians actually were first to discover. Before that, it was discovered in Germany by German physicians and biochemists that they said that solitol consumption uh, you know, has this protein sparing effect. Uh, by the way, although this was not directly it's not directly an answer to the question, but I just remember that before we knew anything about the dental effects of xylitol, we did know about the diabetic effects, because in the former Soviet Union, xylitol had been used already in the 60s as a diabetic sweetener, uh, also in Japan. In, a, in Japan. And I, I have literature references showing that Xylitol was used in Japan already in the 60s to resuscitate patients from diabetic coma. Uh, but again, uh, it's uh, uh, our primary uh, recommendation is to prevent caries and, and, and caries like infections, uh, including otitis media. Uh, it's not a panacea, as I have said at least once. But there are indications of other uses of xylitol. Uh, animal studies suggest that xylitol has not only suggested in animal studies, it has been shown that xylitol can prevent osteoporosis. And also uh, the detrimental um, consequences of diabetes, you can prevent them in experimental animals using xylitol. Uh, you can you can prevent uh, the lens cell opacity, uh, you know, if you if you use solidol in the animal's diet and so forth and so forth. Also, the tensile strength of bones, long bones, can be increased using solidol in the diet or experimental animals and so forth. There are positive effects on the connective tissue. When you use xalitol after the meal, you can stop the acid production directly and then you also get the xalitol into the plaque and affecting the bacteria. That is very good. If you, if you use the xalitol gum before the meal, so you will actually, with the meal, you will nullify the whole good, good uh, effect of xalitol. So xalitol has to be taken after, not within the meal or something. It doesn't have, it's not an antibiotic or something which would remain in the mouth. So you have to really have it directly after the meal and then not eat after anything after, anything after that. It doesn't hurt you at all if you have xalitol before no. the meal. It doesn't hurt. It's not detrimental to you. And uh, um, actually, uh, Dr. Söderling herself has shown in the Michigan study that it can be beneficial in, in some cases to have, to modify dental plaque in advance chemically and microbiologically to, to a certain extent by having xylitol in there. But she's a very modest person and doesn't want to speak about her own research. But uh, um, I, have, I have often given this advice to Japanese dentists that if you want to maximize, maximize the effect of xylitol, it doesn't hurt if you use xylitol also before the sweet, before exposure to sugar. But she's absolutely right that the most important thing is to have xylitol after the meal and after sugary snacks. <laughs> they are not born germ-free. If, if they are born the natural way, they are going to uh, get the flora from the mother. So, and that is also true for the mouth. So those babies that have been born the natural way, they are going to get in this birth channel, they are going to get some bacteria which are going to colonize both the mouth and the intestine. 
So those children who are born, born uh, with the cesarean section, they are born in a certain way in, in, in a native state and they don't get this protective normal frola from their mother. They are born in a certain way germ-free and then they get whatever. And, and they don't get this, actually the, the, the bacteria you get by born the natural way, they are protecting, the, it's normal flora, it's protecting the children. And, and then, for example, these mutant streptococci are not going to at attack them so easily. There is a very nice study by Lee from 2005 showing that, that these, these uh, babies who are born by cesarean section much more easier get this mutants in from in infection from their, from their parents and mothers than those who have been born uh, and are quitting the, the normal flora from their, from their mother. And that's for the whole gastrointestinal tract. Basically, the preference for a sweet flavor, sweet taste is innate. And there are some new studies on that also. And I believe the University of Washington has been involved in some of those, sh showing that, no, you're not going to create a problem by introducing sweet products early on. Uh, the preference is already there. I have the same experience because we did extensive work and consulted uh, experts when we started this pacifier study because we are giving babies a small tablet of xylitol from when they are one month old already. So we wanted to be sure that they are not going to be like any sugar addicts when they are old. Mm -hmm. so, so we have done extensive work on this and it's really innate as, as Dr. Peliak said and there's really no problem here. No, but it, it has been studied in, in physiological studies that, that, uh, that there is a clear, uh, when you give babies, you give sour things and, and you give acidic things and then you give something sweet, they at once feel that it's a good thing. So, so that's innate. There are actually studies showing that by chewing gum uh, after, after dinner, if you have problems with this uh, contents of your stomach coming up, so that is forming a foam, saliva foam on the contents, so it's actually, it has been recommended in some cases. The only problem is that if you have TNG problems, so then, or if you have, if you have problems with, with periodontal diseases, so then you would choose tablets and not chew gum. So you have to have alternative products. But... Uh, I have I have not seen seen any any uh, reports on on this sort of recommended chewing like three times five minutes per day that that could have any negative effects. Chewing gum may be a result of pop culture, um, uh, and uh, uh, some people are arguing that uh, it's a environmental problem because people tend to put the used gum everywhere, <laughs> and a Japanese company. Um, has uh, launched a uh, gum, a, a jar of gum, chewing gums, that has uh, uh, inside of the jar a small pad of, of paper sheets in which you can wrap the used gum and dispose it properly. But um, this is a, a hint, maybe, to <laughs> clear.